evening, everyone. And welcome to the Whitman Power and Privilege Annual Symposium in its 10th edition. I'm Franco. I'm an international student from Palestine. And I'm the programming director of, of Power and Privilege. Hi, everyone. My name is Masha. I'm also an international student from Armenia, and I'm the operations director of this year's symposium. aims to bring attention to sexual violence, oppression, and microaggression. In our theme for this year, Unmasked, we aim to unmask structural violence in the power dynamic in, on this campus and beyond. Before we start, we want to acknowledge that Whitman College occupies traditional territories of the Gayuse, Matila, Walla Walla, Nes Berese, Shoshone Banok, and Burns Bauta people people who were forcibly removed by the Treaty of 1855. We'd also like to ask you to stand up for a moment of silence in appreciation, support, and memory of those who are victims of violence and oppression in the US, Palestine, Ukraine, Sudan, Armenia, Yemen, Congo, and beyond. Thank you. It is our greatest honor, greatest honor to introduce to you Kino Linda Sassour, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York City, in a family of Palestinian immigrants. Linda is rooted to her Arab heritage like an olive tree, like an olive tree in Palestine, holding to the roots of its rich history despite all aggression, despite all aggression facing. In her words, Linda is a Muslim, holds a strong faith and values, fighting for justice, for loving neighbors as oneself. She's a community organizer, strategist, author, and every Islamophobe's nightmare. <laughs> so Linda's journey in activism is marked by her leadership on 2017 Women's March on Washington, one of the largest single-day protests in American history, which sent a bold message about women's rights, civil liberties, and social justice. Her work extends beyond the march. She has also worked for the American Muslim community, the BLM movement, advocating for civil rights, access to education, and action against police brutality. Recognized by Time magazines as one of the 100 most influential, peop influential people, Linda's commitment to justice and equality and the, and the empowerment of marginalized communities embodies the spirit of this symposium as she continues to challenge the status quo and is to inspire a new generation of activists. So please join us in welcoming this exceptional woman, Linda Sarsour. Let's give it up one more time for Franco and Mosh. Good evening, everyone. I feel very deeply honored um, and humbled to be here with you all. And so humbled by the incredible people I have met just within the last 24 hours that I've been here at Whitman College. Um, to Barry's, shout out. Um, Mosh and Franco and Marina and all the incredible folks, Kate and so many others, and getting to meet Dr. Johnson, Dr. Thodic, Dr. Bolton, and so many folks, and getting a tour of the campus here and just being greeted with so much warmth by every single human being that I passed. So I just want to say thank you, Whitman, for giving me this warm welcome to Walla Walla. <laughs> I went to somewhere for the first time. Um, and if it wasn't for Whitman College inviting me here, I probably would have never made my way to this part of Washington State. So thank you, Whitman, for being here. Because now I have some new friends um, and people that I'm going to be connected with even after I leave Whitman today. Or actually, 
it is today because tomorrow I gotta be in Pasco because I went to another airport that was kind of down over here. Um, and I wanted to share this little tidbit with all of you that when I heard that it was called Walla Walla, it made me really chuckle. Because for those of you who are Arabic speakers, when an Arabic speaking person is trying to swear to God about something, we say Walla. And when we're really adamant about you believing what we're saying, we're going to say Walla Walla. So I just thought it was really hilarious that that was the way to So just in case you ever hear that. And I talked to Barry something else. If you wanna, if you have an Arabic speaking friend, an international student who's just taking too long, you say yalla yalla. That means let's go, quick, like let's move it. So I'm just a little Arabic lesson before we get into this. Um, I wanna say thank you to Whitman College because, and I will say that an, an invitation to me in particular, to Linda Sarsour, to a Palestinian American um, in this time is actually quite courageous. Because in college campuses across America, voices like mine are being silenced. Um, there are people who get disinvited from events because of our existence and who we are and the way in which we show up in the world. So I just want to say shout out to Whitman College for saying we will reaffirm academic freedom. We will affirm the exchange of ideas. And we will open space for people to come share who they are, their identities, um, and, and at, at some level, at least giving us a space to share our stories and our experiences. So thank you, Whitman College, for setting a precedent in ways that not many other universities, including the Ivy Leagues, um, are doing right now. And so um, I just hope that folks are proud to go to a university where that is the case, at least today. You know, I come to Whitman College unapologetically Palestinian-American unapologetically Muslim American, and of course, unapologetically from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I'm trying to lighten up my accent just a little bit, but it's hard. And my identity as a Palestinian, and I say this also for my fellow friends that I met here today, the, the, the four full Palestinians that you have at Whitman College, which is actually a pretty good number, um, let me tell you, because there are some colleges that don't have any, but you have four incredible Palestinian students that goes to the school. I'll share with you a story, and I remember um, this very vivid moment that I had when I was a college student, like many of you. And I was standing with a group of people, other fellow students, and one of the department chairs was welcoming us to the school. We were all freshmen. They started asking us where we were from. And so folks were sharing where they were from. You know, they were from Queens, New York. They were from the Bronx. They were from Brooklyn, you know, so that's where we started. And the department chair wanted to get in a little deeper. Well, where are you from, from? So the young people said they were from Mexico. I had another colleague of mine, a fellow student who was from Nigeria, one from Pakistan. But then it was my turn, and I was last. And so the department chair, what about you? Where's your family from? And I said, my family is Palestinian. And this department chair at my university said, oh, um, I didn't mean to get political. <laughs> and at that moment, as a young person, I thought to myself, well, you just asked my three fellow students where they were from, and they all shared. And then when it got to me, all of a sudden, it was political. And so that is the way I started showing up in the world, understanding that my very existence just my breathing in this world as a Palestinian American is in of itself political, politicized, and controversial. So when I am faced with opposition, it's not just because of what I say and what I believe. It is my virtue of who I am and how I show up in the world that is already shunned in many ways. And that moment stuck with me. Many years later, um, I, I have good genes. Palestinians, we got some good genes. We're people of the Holy Land who drink some good water. It's very fertile ground. And so I'm 43 years old, and I have children who have already graduated college. My, both of my children will be graduating with their master's degrees um, this year. And this is a 
this story has stayed with me for almost the last 25 years of my life, and that's how I've been showing up in this world. And I also want to be honest and truthful in this space, and I hope that you give me that opportunity. That I'm walking around like many Palestinians with a dark cloud, and this dark cloud follows me everywhere that I go. And as many of you know, there is a humanitarian crisis that is unfolding right now in Gaza. Over 35,000 plus human beings that are related to us, that are part of our extension of who we are as people, have been slaughtered. And every day when I wake up, as many people do now in this digital era, we pick up our phones and we, you know how it is, the first thing you do in the morning is you pick up your phone and you start checking social media. And I just want you to imagine being able to watch video after video after video and the trauma that comes from that for any ordinary person to watch bloodshed, but to also see it happening directly to the people that you love. And so I say to folks all the time that I'm not okay. I'm not okay. I'm not mentally okay. And I hope that people, if you are a member of a marginalized community, that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. And I am not okay. You know, there's been a lot of horror that has happened in this world that continues to happen. And I want to just be clear that what's happening to the Palestinian people is not the first time that horror has struck this world. I mean, we could sit here for days, and I'm sure you learned about this in your college courses. Darfur, Rwanda, the Holocaust, Cambodia. I mean, we could sit here for days, the extermination of the indigenous people of the Americas, the enslavement of black people. I mean, we could for days and days and sit here and talk about the horror that has been inflicted in this world by other human beings. What makes this moment different is that we're watching it in real time. I watch it in HD, color. Like, I can pick up the phone right now and watch something horrible that's happening. And to be able to watch something so horrific 24 hours, seven days a week, is something that I want you to understand is absolutely traumatic. Not just for the people who are experiencing it, but being an American, living in this country as a Palestinian, and knowing that there's, as much as I think I'm doing as much as I can, that I have not been able to stop that horror that is happening to my people. So I ask people to give us grace, to give Arab Americans grace who are also uh, somehow in many ways connected to that. Like we know what's happening in Lebanon, right? So if you have folks who are from Lebanon and watching what's happening across that region, happy, the ways in which Muslim Americans are connected to that part of the world, we just need grace. And so in this moment, I come here with perpetual grief. Like I wake up in full grief every day. I also wake up with perpetual outrage at people in power who have the ability to do something about this and are choosing either to look the other way or justify or aid and abet what's happening in Palestine. And so when I come here to Whitman College, I want to be able to share with you who I am, what I believe, and how I got to where I am today. And I got to meet with a lot of incredible young people today and I was really impressed with this idea of, oh, I'm studying politics. Because some people will say I'm studying political science, right? <laughs> politics is not how it's framed in other universities. And I think this concept of politics is actually very interesting to see people frame their degrees in that way. And what is politics? What do, what do, what do people mean? And I was so moved by the ways in which young people at this university have interpreted what their role is, what politics means to them, and where they're going to take their degree outside of this room. And let me tell you, it is incredible. And honestly, it was the hope that I needed to know that there are these incredible young people that want to change the world. And even in all, amidst the darkness of the world that is around us, they somehow, they somehow see something that I don't see. They see something beyond today. They have a vision for a future, and I hope that Whitman College is proud that these young people will be going out into this world with a high quality education from this university. Um, the world isn't just dark in Palestine, so let's all be clear here. The world is very dark in many places. It is dark in Sudan. It is dark in the Congo. 
It is dark amongst the Uyghur Muslims in China. It is dark in Central America and in South America. And it is dark right here in the United States of America. We could just go maybe an hour out, two hours out. Sometimes we think about things that are happening far away, but really you can go to any state in America and you will find those communities that are the most marginalized, the most forgotten right here. Oftentimes we define violence. People talk about violence and people think violence means something like bloodshed or it means that somebody has to get killed to be violent. And I remind people all the time that poverty is violence. Poverty is violence. Child poverty in a country like the United States of America is violence. The lack of housing and affordable housing that causes people to be houseless is violence. Inadequate health care particularly amongst communities of color, is violence, my friends. I think about police brutality, although that is a visible, obviously, force of violence. But when you have police officers who are sworn to protect and serve our communities, that take innocent lives like Breonna Taylor, or George Floyd, or Eric Garner, or Oscar Grant, or we could sit here for days and name young black men and women for many, many, many weeks. That is violence. And of course, genocide is violence. And being able to sit in our communities and think about what do we do? How do we show up? And so I'll tell you a, a little bit about how I got into this work because it was so beautiful to actually ask a lot of the young folks. I said, why are you doing politics? Like, who wants to do politics in this country with this political system? Because my friends, we are in big trouble. And just say that Linda Sarsour told us at Women College that we're in big trouble this year, just so you all know. And it's terrible, and I feel sad saying that, but it's... And every single person that said, I'm studying politics, it all came from a personal place. Maybe they're Armenian, and there is chaos in Armenia. Maybe it's because they're young and black in America, and want to be the change that they want to see. Maybe it's because they experienced something directly as a marginalized person, and their personal experience is informing that they don't have to be on the sidelines, that they're not going to be bystanders, which is the whole point of my book that I wrote, by the way, but that they were going to be part of the system. They were going to go in and they were going to transform the system in many ways. And that is what happened to me. And I just want people to know, like, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, when I grow up, I want to be a poorly paid activist that works 23 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, me? I want to be visible and get targeted by people who are opposed to my values. Oh, oh, me? I want to not be unionized, but fight for other people to be unionized. This is crazy, my friend. <laughs> the nonprofit is probably one of the last industries to be unionized, but I'm outside fighting for the workers to get unionized. And I said, somebody over here, who are the people that are supposed to help us? But anyway, we'll talk about that some other time. Um, and so my big dream was, I am a product of the New York City public school system. And I'm very grateful to my teachers who are part of why I am who I am today. And I went to a high school in New York City called John Jay High School. About 80% black, 10% Latino, and 10% everybody else. And that was the everybody else part. And my big dream was that when I grow up, and go to college, I'm gonna come back and teach English at my high school. That's what I wanted to do, I just wanted to be a high school English teacher. That was my big dream. I wanted to teach at my old high school because I felt an affinity to young people of color and I watched how the system failed them. My high school had police officers in our school before NYPD was a thing in schools, which it is right now. My school had bars, it looked like a prison. If you came to John Jay High School, even today, it looks like a prison. 
I had medical detectors in my school that are like airport style. You walked into school in the morning, you passed your book bag through the airport, you went up against the wall and you were stopped and frisked. Guess who got stopped and frisked longer than everybody else? Something about that always didn't sit right with me. Something about that always was wrong. We were not the high school that was allowed to go out for lunch as many other high schools in New York City and other neighborhoods were. So these young people were learning in classrooms with bars on the window and airport security going into a school every single morning. But something about being in the school inspired me. Inspired me to see young people who are being bused from across the city to the school in a generally affluent neighborhood in Brooklyn called Park Slope, trying their best um, and really trying to survive in a system that they didn't actually believe in them. So that was my big dream. And then when I was 21 years old and I was a college student, the horrific attacks of 9-11 happened. And that horrific attack shook the whole country. It didn't matter if you were from Walla Walla, if you were from Los Angeles, you were from Chicago, you were from Richardson, Texas, it didn't matter. But I also want you to imagine what it felt like to be a New Yorker and to be in the belly of the beast where this actually happened. And so we were, our, my community that I was born and raised in, in Brooklyn, was a very Muslim community. I, I, I grew up around my own community in Southwest Brooklyn. And we were just as horrified as everybody else, because this happened in our city. And I remember that day when I walked home from my college campus because there were no public transportation in New York. Everything was shut down in New York City. And I walked home, and I walked down our main street in my community, Fifth Avenue, and I saw all these Muslim-owned businesses closed. Something didn't sit right with me, because remember, just to age myself just a little bit, back in 2001, when most of you weren't born, there was no Twitter, my friends. You couldn't just pick up your phone to be like, let's see what's trending online, what's happening. That didn't exist. We didn't have flat screen TVs on our college campuses that told us what the upcoming events were. We had bulletin boards still at that time. And the internet was down anyway, although we were still up on, um, we were still in AOL.com days at that time. And I know people don't, people think that it wasn't that long ago, but it was kind of a long time ago. And so we were still in the transition for folks who are, you know, 80s, 90s babies. And so imagine walking home from your college campus, knowing something very eerie and terrible happened, but you don't know what happened. So until I got to the main street of my community and I saw all these Muslim businesses closed at 11.30 a.m., something just, you know, when you get that like thing in the pit of your stomach, I was like, oh my God, like something bad happened. And then I walked by my mosque. And my mosque never, in the history of the mosque, did I ever know that my mosque had a gate that they could pull down, because I'd never seen that gate before. It was always, my mosque was always open. People slept in my mosque because this was on the main street in Brooklyn. Like, if people didn't have a place to stay, they would be sleeping on the carpet in my mosque. Like, my mosque could never close. But that day, the gate was down. That really was the kind of thing that really got me to a place where I was like, something really horrible happened. And so I continued to walk home. And that home at the time was actually my mother's house. I wasn't living there, but she was watching my children. I was a young parent. I had my first child when I was 19 years old and my second child when I was 20 years old. And when I got to my mother's house, my mother ran out the house as I got there and she said, I gotta go pick up your brother from school. Now mind you, it's still like 12 o'clock, noon time. But the thing that made that even more eerie was why was my mother leaving the house without her hijab, which is what I'm wearing. And I said to my mother, hey, you're not wearing your hijab, and my mom said, you can't wear it right now. Now, mind you, I still don't know what happened, so this whole thing is really wild to me. And then when my mother just left, jumped into her car, and I went inside, and my son at the time was two years old, you know, you, young, young people, little, little toddler, he said, Mom, he said, come see the fire, come see the fire. And as you know at the time, it was the loop, loop, loop of the falling of the towers, the smoke that was happening, the fire, of course. And that is when I sat down and I started watching the chirons at the bottom of the screen. Islamic terrorists, the Muslim terrorists, Islamic terrorism, and then immediately I knew exactly what happened. And that day I went from being a regular old New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, 
lived in a beautiful, diverse city. I love my city so much. To a member of a suspect community. Our neighbors treated us differently. Um, and not only did we start feeling it from our neighbors and our friends and some of our, our shopkeepers, our government made some big decisions. And our government needed to give something to the American people. So what did they decide to do? They, start, they decided to descend on the communities that I was from. And so what I will say to all of you, and people might say this is hyperbole, but I promise you if you went on the internet, you could see all of this happen. I watched it in real time. The United States government descended on my very Muslim community, the most highly concentrated Muslim community in all of New York at that time. And of course, the communities have grown now in many parts of New York City and even the state. And every level of law enforcement descended on my community. NYPD intelligence, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, NCIS, uh, immigration type you know, enforcement folks. This is before ICE was a thing. There was no ICE at the time. And I remember watching children from a window, watching their fathers being taken away in unmarked cars in Brooklyn, New York, and the government kidnapping our fathers and brothers. And people say kidnapping. Kidnapping to me is defined by when you take someone and don't tell people where you're taking them. That, my friends, is called kidnapping. And the government was kidnapping people in our community. And I remember that Friday, after the horrific attacks of 9-11, going to my local mosque and watching women who came to pray at the mosque go directly to our religious leader, who is kind of like our priest, and crying and saying, look, they came to my house and they took my husband, they took my son, they took my brother, whatever that was, whatever the person's relation to them. And I'm standing there as an American, like I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. I said, what is going on here? And just to be clear, my religious leader was from Egypt. He was an immigrant to America with an R1 visa. He, came, he said, listen, I came here to be a spiritual leader. I didn't come here to be, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an advocate. I ran away from this in Egypt. I don't know why it's ha what's happening here. And I'm grateful to God that my parents taught me to speak fluent English and also Arabic so that I can be someone that can live in two worlds where I can help my people. And so I became a translator. And so I want you to imagine a 21-year-old translator going to detention centers across the Northeast. Immigration detention centers where we were literally looking for fathers, brothers, and sons in our community. So that was my introduction to a terrible world. Now, I, now remember, I always felt uneasy about things that I saw and I witnessed, but I never had the words to articulate what was it that was making me feel uneasy. Just like when I watched young black boys and girls get stopped in prison in my school, something about that didn't sit right with me, but I still couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then now I was watching it in real time, an injustice that was happening to people who were from my community and looked just like me. And ever since that, those days of volunteering as a translator, I made a decision. I said, who's going to fight for my people more than I can fight for my people? And so for the last 23 years, this is what I've been doing. Organizing, building, and connecting the dots, my friends. Because there's something that I will say about folks who are progressive. This whole, I organize for environmental justice over here. I organize for women's rights back over there. I organize for access to health care over here. We do racial justice in this corner. This is not going to work, my friends. And this is why we are in the situation that we are in right now. We have to organize from a philosophy that tells us that we cannot have single-issue struggles because we do not live single-issue lives. Yeah. And Audrey Lord told us that a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm in a space right now where I believe that if there is one marginalized community in this country, you're all marginalized. I don't care how good your life is. Because I promise you that we live in a country that has marginalized people cyclically. And they're going to get to you at some point. And we have seen that historically in these United States of America. One of the moments in American history that's 
always terrifies me as a Muslim American is Japanese internment. In this country, just about maybe 82 years ago, which is not that long ago, this country decided that Japanese Americans were the enemy within. And they went around and they detained Japanese Americans with their children, including someone like former Congressman Mike Honda from California, put children and their families in detention camps on American soil. And the arguments that they made was that the Japanese could not be loyal to this country. That you couldn't be someone of Japanese descent and an American at the same time. And the entire Japanese American community was a suspect community in America. And we went as far as detaining them. And what makes that period in American history terrifying is that the American people turned their a blind eye to it. So I want you to imagine people who are good people in America who watched their neighbors get dragged out and detained and probably thought to themselves, this is kind of bad. This doesn't seem right, but didn't do anything about it. Oftentimes closing their window blinds and saying, wow, this is really bad, but not really stepping up to put their bodies on the line to say, this should not be happening on my watch. And we continue to see that in the United States of America. We see that with undocumented immigrants. We have, I mean, people will talk about history and do Operation Wetback, where we deported two million people that did not cross the border, by the way, but the border crossed them, just so we're all clear. Mm -hmm. And people will always talk in the past tense but nobody wants to talk about today. Even someone as revered as President Obama was, who made history in America as the first black president, he deported more immigrants than any other presidential administration in US history. And then the work continued under every administration after that. We still live in a country where people are react, reaffirmed by the papers that they have forgetting the history and how this nation was even founded in the first place. People will say, oh, we ended slavery in America. And what we did really is we just repackaged it. That's what we did. And nobody wants to sit with that because it's so uncomfortable. Did you ever ask yourself, why is it that we live in the United States of America that has 330 million people, but we hold a quarter of the entire world's prison population? How is that possible? when we're competing with countries like India that has a billion people, China that has a billion people, and we hold one out of every four prisoners in the entire world. Because it's modern day slavery. Because the United States of America figured out how to profit off of imprisoned people. So even when we think about, when we see people say, Linda, modern day slavery, you're going a little too far for me here. That's an industry. Our prison system is an industry in this country. It is there are corporations who profit off of imprisoned people. It's cheaper to educate people than it is to incarcerate them. Mm -hmm. But we will still choose to incarcerate people versus investing in their education. And then we look at the population of our prison system. Let's be honest. Majority, 99%, are either black, brown, poor, or immigrant. That's the bottom line. That's not my statistic. That's the data that's out there. I tell people all the time that we are a difficult generation. We have a lot to reckon with, my friends. And sometimes I'm not going to lie to you, I feel ashamed. Imagine we come from descendants of people in this country who fought for our right to vote. And in cities across America and states across America, we have people who wake up every morning trying to figure out how to take some of your right to vote away. We are a generation that has, is watching in real time the rolling back of rights that people died for, like affirmative action. That, that happened now. Somebody sometimes they look at you and say, what in the hell are you doing? when they were rolling back things like affirmative action. Women in America, 55 some odd years ago, fought for right 
of a woman to choose in America. And in your generation, that is no longer a true right that you have. And what I keep telling people is that if you look at the beginnings and the foundings of this country, of course, on the extermination of indigenous people, on, on the enslavement of black people. But every, when you start looking from then to now, over the course of, we're almost going to get to the 250 years since the Declaration of Independence, every generation got a little more. Even if it was just a little bit, there was always some level of progress. Imagine that we are the first generation in American history that has to say to another generation after us that you got less rights than me. That's never happened before. Mm -hmm. Even as little progress that there has been, your grandmother can look at you and say, you got a little more rights than I have. And then your mother can say, you got a little more rights than I have. But you have to say to some young people in your life in the future, you actually got less rights than I have. And that says something. It says something about us. One of the things that I critique this country, because I love this country, James Baldwin said that I didn't say it. I have every right to critique this country. Because when you love somebody, or you love something, you want it to be the best that it can be. I'm not going to ever be in the mindset that this is just how it is, or this is just how it's supposed to be. One thing that I'll critique about American culture is this. Many of, the, many of you in this room come from uh, even, even folks, even black folks who are black American, even what we call black American culture, shares this with immigrant communities and folks from around the world. We come from community. We are rooted in this idea that it takes a village. We are connected to grandma, you know who your neighbor is. We are collective in the way that we show up in the world. American culture is in opposition to that. This culture teaches you that every man and woman for themselves, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. If you got health care, if you got a job, if you got a scholarship to Whitman College, why are you worrying about the kids that don't got no scholarship? You got some health care, why are you worried about the people that don't have health care? Why are you worried about everybody else? Worry about yourself. Go home, close the door, and as long as everybody that's in your immediate family is cool, don't worry about anybody else. And that has been the downfall of the United States of America and got us to the place where we are today. And so one of the things that I've been, this has been my whole philosophy on life is this. I don't care how good I'm. I know that I'm not free. And one of the things I say to people as a Palestinian, and I'm going to say this in this room, because I think it's important, because I think there are always people that are not sure, especially when folks like me come to your college campus. As a Palestinian, this is what I believe, even as it relates to what's happening right now in Palestine. I don't believe, fundamentally I don't believe this, that any group of people can ever have safety and security at the expense of another people. I don't believe that. And even if you believe that, it's not actually going to manifest in reality. If someone in America offered me and said, Linda, as a Muslim American, I got you. You will have access to full rights in this country. You will be safe and you will be free and you will get access to housing and you will have a living wage and you'll get everything. But in order for you to get all of that, you have to sign this document that says, this group of people will not. I would never, ever accept a form of safety and security at the expense of any other people. Because that, my friends, does not exist. And it will never exist. And you will never be safe and secure as long as someone else is not safe and secure.
peace with people who challenge what you believe. That's okay. That you sit with that and you ask yourself a question. You say, what is it about what this woman is saying that's making me feel uncomfortable this moment? And to ask yourself, can it be possible that because I don't agree with someone that that person makes me unsafe just for the nature of I don't agree? Family, I want you to remember one thing for me here in this room today. Unity is not uniform. Unity is not uniform. There is no way that if we went to 1,600 students at Whitman College and asked and gave them a survey, that we're all going to walk out of that survey with 100% alignment. We're going to disagree. Because guess what? We were born and raised in different places. We were born in different socioeconomic statuses. We may come from different faiths or no faith at all. We are just different people. And our experiences inform what we believe. So how could it be possible that we could, any of us could be in a space and believe that we're all going to be on the same page? And so what I challenge you all in this room is, have those hard conversations. Don't shy away from those conversations. But here's how I want you to have those conversations. Here's what I don't do. We're not going to debate. You're not going to pull out talking points and start telling me and doing a statistical debate with me and data. It's not how I, it's not how I live in this world. I'm sure the data is important, but it's not going to move me in any way. You know what moves me? Storytelling moves me. Tell me what is it about your experience. Tell me what is it about you that makes you believe the things that you believe. Because oftentimes we listen to people without context. And that's why I believe everybody's redeemable. Because there's always a reason why somebody believes the thing that they believe, even if you fundamentally disagree with it. And you know what changes people? Meeting people, listening to stories, speaking from the eye. I'm a Palestinian American. I do not speak on behalf of 8 million Palestinians in this world, just so we're all clear. And also, I'm Muslim. And there are about 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, and dark guarded, I definitely don't speak on behalf of all of them either. And you know what? They probably wouldn't want me to do that. <laughs> but, and that's the other thing. The other thing that, for me, is always about, you are an individual. And there's always these people making these big proclamations, and these, these big declarations on behalf of a nation state, or on behalf of a group. This is not how the world works, my friend. This is not how we're going to be able to have those courageous conversations that are going to get us to a place where we say, you know what, let us agree to disagree. But there's a line, and I'm going to tell you what the line is, because there's always a line. So as long as you are not debating my right to exist, you and me can still have a conversation. If your belief is rooted in the idea that I'm not supposed to exist, we can't have a conversation. But if you believe that Palestinians are real people and we exist, and you want to have that conversation, we can have that conversation. And I promise you that there have been many transformative opportunities. I'm going to tell you a quick story that I told these folks. I went to UMass Amherst. And before I got to UMass, I'm not going to lie to you, it was you know, some faculty and students, and they did this whole thing. They were like, look, Linda, you know, we want to make sure that you feel really welcome at our school and word on the street is that there's these young men in our, you know, student population, they were like the college Republican types, they're going to come and, you know, they might, you know, interrupt, they might, they might, you know, they were telling me all these things. So I looked at the facts and I said, why are you all worked up? So what if they get up and challenge you? What's the problem? Just let them do whatever it is that they want to, it's their college, I'm the guest here. If they want to get up and challenge something that I say, they should be able to do that. So we go to the venue, you know, they point them out to me. They said, you know, just look up there, you know, so she told me where the young people were sitting. And I watched them the whole time. I didn't look them directly in the eye, but I could see them. And I got up there and I spoke for about 45 minutes, had a great time, had a standing ovation. It was great. People asked me some hard questions. I did my best to answer. And so then after the event, we went outside out of the Fine Arts Center, and there were people just hanging out on the college campus, very beautiful campus, just like women. And I locked eyes with one of the young men. And it was like literally like the Red Sea party. <laughs> Everybody moved out of the way, and we walked towards each other. It was a very dramatic scene. And I went up to the young man, I put my hand out, and he put his hand 
went out and I introduced myself to him and he introduced himself to me and I said, I got a question to ask. He said, yeah. I said, you know, I did my little Brooklyn thing, you know, we're from the East Coast. I said, listen, I said, word on the street was you were coming to protest me. What happened, my friend? What, what, what changed? And let me tell you, this 19-year-old young man said something to me so profound that stays with me till today. This was like six years ago. This was like 2000, end of 2017. He said to me, you know, I thought I should just give you a chance. That's it. This is a young, I mean, he's as old as my children. So he made a decision that day, probably watched me a little bit from afar, and said, you know what, let me give this lady a chance. Let me see what she got to say. And it looked like there wasn't really anything that I said that he fundamentally disagreed with, which is why he didn't get up to interrupt me. One of the other young men in his group did get up and ask me a hard question. He asked me a whole question about Zionism. And I answered it in a way that he probably never heard before. I critiqued Zionism as a Palestinian American in a way that he said, I get what you're saying. He may not have agreed with what I said, but because I shared it from my own personal experience and the story of my grandparents, it didn't give him an opportunity to debate me. Because the one thing you can't debate people on, my friends, and I'm going to give you this as a lesson, you can't debate people's experiences. You can't tell somebody that's not how you're supposed to feel. You can't tell somebody that's not your story. So when I share what Zionism meant to my grandparents and to my great-grandparents, Someone who is a plain Zionist can't say to me, well, that didn't actually happen. Because our families were displaced. They were dispossessed. And there is an occupation that everybody recognizes. And so that was an opportunity for someone to say, I see what you're saying. Now, I don't agree with you, but I get why you believe what you believe. And that's the place that I'm trying to get to in this world. I want to I wanna live in a world where no one believes in an ideology that requires the oppression of another people. So that's the kind of world that I want to live in. Now I'm an organizer, so I wouldn't be an organizer if I didn't tell you that there were some things that you needed to do. <laughs> because I don't like those speakers that just come and tell you all this stuff and then you just walk away and then you're like, but, okay, then what? Because now I'm fired up, like what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Number one, I need you to be excellent. You're at Women College, I need you to get those degrees, I need you to study, and I need you to be excellent wherever you go. Because we actually need good people and excellent people in every sector in this country. So just because you're into physics or you're doing biology, it doesn't mean that we don't need people in biology and physics who are somewhere who are excellent and kind and compassionate people. So just, let's start there. Because your parents sent you here for a reason, you got a scholarship for a reason, get that degree. But you can also find some time to do something good, even as a college student. I do not prescribe to this idea that you're a busy college student and don't got time for something that is worthwhile and purposeful. Even if that means once a month you find a local food pantry, even if you got to drive out just a little bit, to provide some service in a community that needs you. I don't believe that you don't have the time to do that. Find an organization that works on an issue that you care about. It doesn't even matter what it is to me. Maybe you care about animal rights. Maybe you want to volunteer at a local, you know, shelter, animal shelter. Maybe there's a local domestic violence shelter here with children who need people to read books to them because their mothers are going through such stressful times. Maybe there's an organization here that's teaching immigrants and migrants English and you can go and tutor and study, help people maybe prepare for their naturalization exams. Trust me when I tell you, even Walla Walla got those people. And they need you. Something else that I always say to college students, too, because I also don't believe this. College students are always like, I got no money. I'm broke as broke as me. <laughs> I don't believe that. And what I mean by that is that it's not about how much money you have. It's about being consistent in a behavior. That means that even if you had only $2 a week that you put to the side, and at the end of the month you had $8 or $10 or even $20, and you said, you know what I'm going to do? Every month I'm going to give $10 or $20 a month to an organization that does something that I believe in. And a lot of people will say, look, the $10, $20, like what's that gonna do? You know, I ran a, a small nonprofit refugee serving organization in New York City for 15 years. 
If 20 people gave me $20, that was $400. You know what $400 did? You paid my light bill at my organization. So do not underestimate a small, humble donation to a small nonprofit organization. I promise you, it goes farther than you can even imagine. We're in an election right now. And I know people are tired of hearing that because I'm tired of hearing that. And I'm not going to get into that because that's drama. We could get into a lot of drama <laughs> talking about this upcoming election. But what I say to people, what I'm telling you to do is this. All politics is local, my friends. All politics is local. Don't be distracted by the sitcom that we have on the national level where people wake up every four years and start telling me about the lesser of two evils, when in fact the people that do impact your lives are your local representatives. I don't care if you're from Boise, Idaho, if you're from Chicago, if you're originally from you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it doesn't matter where you're from. All politics is local, my friends. Get your absentee ballots and vote in your local elections. When you look at some of the most horrific legislation that's being passed across this country or on the tables, you know where they are? They are in your state legislators. That's where they are. They're in the chambers of your state legislator. And guess what? In this country, sometimes your states have more power than the federal government, as you could probably imagine as you watch this happen across the country. So what I say to people is do not forfeit your right to vote and focus on your local politics. And I don't and I and I and I and I say this to all of you in this room because it really like I'm gonna say this, when in New York when an election season comes up, even if I'm not excited about the candidates, there's something in that for me where I get up and I still go to the polls. You know why? Because there was bloodshed in this country for my right to vote. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes even if I'm not excited, like sometimes even in the presidential in New York, I have the privilege of being able to vote third party and not impact the election in any way, just vote from a place of principle. And I go to the polls, I promise you that every step that I take, I'm honoring the sacrifices that came before. So don't forfeit that. There, and when I say there was bloodshed, I'm not even exaggerating. There are people that died in this country so that women can have the right to vote, so that black people can have the right to vote, black women can have the right to vote. Because of work of those who shed blood in the Civil Rights Movement, there was the Immigration Act that allowed my parents to come to America. People sometimes are not even operating in the context of how they even got here in the first place. And so I'm saying to all of you, please, especially young people, do not forfeit your right to vote in this country. And even if that means you've got to show up to the polls just to honor those who sacrificed before you, please do that. I don't even care who you vote for. I just need you to get up and I need you to vote. And as you're voting, here's what I got, I'm going to say to all of you. Because this is where privilege comes. When I go to the polls to vote, and I think about this, this is how I think about it on the federal level, right? Because you have to figure, you gotta make sense of this stuff that happens. I do what I call a solidarity vote. And I say to myself, I'm outraged, I'm not feeling any of these people, but then I start to think, and people come to mind. I start thinking about marginalized communities. And I say to myself, is the choice that I'm making today going to harm anyone further than they're already harmed? And that's the question that I ask myself, because guess what? It ain't just about me. It's not about me. And remember what we said earlier? We have to oppose the culture that tells you it is about you, because this country tells you it is about you. I'm rejecting that, and I'm saying it's about all of us. And even when I'm feeling a certain way, sometimes it's not about my feelings. It's about someone who is much more harmed than you, who has less privilege and access than I do, and I may be in a place of power, just for example, like undocumented people. Guess what, they don't have the, they don't, this country doesn't offer them the right to elect people to make decisions about their life, because they quote, don't have the right papers. But guess what, I do. Incarcerated people in this country, they take their right to vote away, but guess what? They still have children in public schools. They still have family. They still have health care. And one day they're going to come outside and they're going to need support. So they don't have that right in prison to vote, but I do. Mm -hmm. So I start thinking about that. I think about children, children in our country, marginalized children, who don't have the right to vote here because they're not the right age. But guess what I do? So you know what? When I go into the polls, that's, how, that's what I ask myself. And I hope that, that you do the same thing. The last thing is this, and I tell you I age myself, but I don't know if 
hold some of our my you know more seasoned friends in the room. <laughs> Remember the days where we didn't have cell phones. Like I'm sorry, I, I know I don't look that old, but I was I, I came from that generation. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have iPads. A couple of cool people might have had a laptop, but that was like lavish if you had a laptop back in the 80s or the 90s. That was not a thing. And we didn't have social media. And some people had some cell phones, but you got to pay for every text, and you only had a limited amount of minutes. Except for after 9 o'clock, so you can talk all night after 9 o'clock. This is the, I know the young people are like, that's why. But that is the life, my friends, that I lived until like 23, 24, when Facebook kind of came into the picture. But my point is that I grew up at a time where I knew everybody on my block. You can tell me the house number, 541, and I can tell you that's Joshua and his mother's Mary. I can tell you everything about my neighbors. I can tell you where they're from. I played with the kids in the street. I went to school with them. My mom needed something. She could be like, look, I got to go talk to my neighbor, just let you know my kids are in the house. Like, we had that kind of relationship. Now we live in a world where people don't even know who their next, neighbor, next door neighbor is. People will walk this college campus, they'll sit next to a student for a whole semester, and they may not even know the name of the student that they're sitting next to. So here's what I want you to do today. Before you leave this room, find somebody that you don't know and just go up to somebody and say, hey, my name is Linda, what's your name? Oh, do you go to Whitman College? What do you study at Whitman College? Oh, I study, I learned a new thing today. What was it called, Iris? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Whitman College, for having us. 